Hey everybody, welcome to Five Rounds Today. I am John Ramdean, he is Robin Black, and of course we discuss everything in the world of combat sports, specifically mixed martial arts, but you know when uh, these tomato cans are calling it the fight of the century, we gotta talk about the fight of the century, which I think a lot of boxing purists would call it the best fight of maybe the last decade. Yeah. Floyd Mayweather Jr. taking on M Manny Pacquiao, a fight years in the making. Uh, could this fight live up to the hype? Impossible, unless you're a real boxing fan and you just needed to see what would happen if Floyd Mayweather faced Manny Pacquiao. And I think we got exactly what you would anticipate if you've seen either one of these guys fight. Uh, Mayweather doing the typical Mayweather style, and I think, again, purists and uh, people that appreciate boxing see a master at work in Floyd Mayweather. He understands how to control and manage that chaos inside of the ring. Very few people, it seems, especially this generation, uh, have the home inside of the ring like Floyd Mayweather. Yeah, it's quite amazing. I mean, the martial art of boxing yeah. is a beautiful art. It's a beautiful... The most refined, yeah. almost. It's definitely been uh, able to evolve at a high rate, money motivates a lot of things. Right. So when you can make a lot of money from being good at a thing, that motivates more money to train, more money to research, more money to have fights mm -hmm. and see it. So I think as a result, because this has been a money-making combat sport for so long, you've been able to really refine it. Uh, soccer is a sport where guys kick around a football, and it's kind of the same. It's really evolved because there's stadiums full of people that spend money, and so you have better coaching, and all of the resources come into play. Soccer, much like Floyd Mayweather, uh, Mayweather, you you know your team will win one nothing, yeah. and uh, and or nil nil or nil nil, but they were better <laughs> and uh, defensively brilliant. Like the evolution of soccer is to be able to stop guys from scoring on you. That's what Mayweather did. I mean, he's brilliant at it. How on earth you can take the guy who's the second best boxer of your era and make him miss you hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times and barely land at all? I mean, you still get hit eighty sometimes. That. That's what's tough about combat sports. Imagine just hit your hand 80 times oh, yeah. on this table. I like know. it's gonna really, really hurt. So there's understated dangers even in the most defensively brilliant performance. But that's what Floyd Mayweather has always done. I mean, people are like, oh, this is gonna be a crazy fight. And everyone I talked to him was like, well, if Mayweather wins and he does it the way he wants to do it, it's not gonna be a crazy fight unless you happen to like defensive brilliance. Yeah, what's remarkable about this, the whole spectacle of the event that happened this weekend is that everybody, every news outlet, outlet every social media uh, site, everybody was discussing this main event. People that I've never heard about yeah. talk about boxing, talking about boxing, I was listening to one radio station in my hometown and they were they were honest when they said, "Okay, it just comes down to who wants it more." Yeah. And one of the guys was saying that uh, Mayweather, he no longer wants it anymore. That the, <laughs> that's the, what these guys are saying. <laughs> yeah. Basically, what he says, and that it's Manny Pacquiao's time to shine. It is not that simple, people. <laughs> yeah. it's, uh, you're talking about somebody that has an understanding of the art that very few people in the world yeah, have a, yeah. that type of understanding. And it's, it's real time. Like I sit and I, uh, you watch Mayweather getting uh, advice in the corner. And as it, you try to put yourself in a situation, if you're being Floyd or your coach, it's like, well, Floyd's actually executed it. Yeah. Sure, somebody's coaching him, but Floyd is the man. He knows almost 50 times what it's like to be in there with the best competition yeah. in the world. So you can understand, because afterwards Floyd had his comment to, to um, Larry Merchant, and uh, the, the fact is, if you are at that level, you would imagine everybody else that talks about boxing is a, a moron yeah, right. because they just simply right. don't have the understanding that you have. Mm -hmm. It's true. It's also relative. Like if you talk to somebody who is, you know, an accounting genius, you talk to them about your bills and stuff, they just look... They, like, how can you not know anything about accounting? Yeah, right. And that's the case with somebody. I mean, we'll talk to people who've just started covering the sport. And, you know, as long as you're not in a rude or exhausted or just a dick m mood, you yeah. try not to say, oh, my God, you really don't know anything <laughs> yeah, about right. this. And Matt Hume did that to me. 
You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And actually, he was super. Well, you were there. Yeah, he was. You know, we were talking to him. He was super cool about it. But he's on a level far beyond. You know, I'm asking questions that he's understood for ten years, mm-hmm. and that that is always there. And, and one of the reasons why is we were discussing today Bruce Lee's one of his books, oh. The Tao of Bruce Lee, and the stuff that Bruce Lee was doing in the '60s. That stuff that's people are doing today and Matt Hume yeah. that's yeah. part of his lineage so you can understand how would he, he would have these the understanding of this stuff way before anybody else yeah this conversation actually connects together a lot more than I think you might think because Bruce Lee in his quest to understand how everything worked and what is the the way to fight what is the ultimate ways to fight among it he looked as he studied different martial arts and boxing he he saw right away yeah. this is so evolved Valuable. so refined and so good uh, but there's other little things in it. I mean, one of the things that he, he was about getting there the quickest and closing the distance fast, doing damage to you the quickest way to hurt you. And so one of the things he developed was right hand, power hand forward. Mm. So you could leap in and hit people. That worked against really poorly trained fighters as you were way better than everyone. If he continued into the 70s, 80s, and the 90s, I guarantee you he would have changed it back because right. as people got better, you'd be like, wait a second. This worked against p- poorly trained people, but against a very good fighter, mm-hmm. I'm now defensively liable because really my stance with my power hand back is a way that I can control myself better. Actually, probably undoubtedly what he would have done is become ambidextrous. And no because question. It, because I've I've also yeah. heard one of the, the tools right now, if, if you're an orthodox fighter, uh, for example, to have your right hand, or sorry, a southpaw fighter, to have your right hand forward makes sense, even if you're an orthodox yeah. fighter, switch hand, because your jab is what a lot of people say the most effective yeah. weapon. And if it's your main weapon, if, that, if your right hand is your tool, that's the weapon that's constantly being used. So why not utilize the tool that is the most yeah. effective? But I can understand why well, you, you want to inflict the, you trade yeah. off, because you yeah. want to to be able to land that one with the most power, and that's the hand that you favor the most. Yeah, all of these things are at play in trying to figure out how to fight. And so uh, there's a massive advantage in being uh, a southpaw. So much so that in areas of the world that are in turmoil, in areas of the world that have war for a certain amount of generations, the percentage of southpaws that are born goes up. It's such an advantage in war and in combat that in areas- Is it forced? Do they force? I don't know if that's the case or it's human adaptation to, to trouble. So in areas of high crime even, areas of the United States of high crime, there are more south, more less left-handed kids wow. born. I don't know if that's human adaptation. We'll have to look into that. That'll be, be fascinating. Because apparently I was born as a left-hand, that I was yep. writing with my left hand. So I'd pick yep. up the pen and my teachers would put right. the, the pen or the pencil over to my right hand to teach me how. I can't imagine trying to write with my left hand right now yeah. because it becomes second nature. Now I'm right-handed. But as a result, you'll play hockey one way and baseball that's a different what, way happens. because of that. No. And that is what you do with a lot of guys. We talked uh, to uh, Lawler. And he's actually ambidextrous, yeah, right. and he picked the stance he wants. But if you think of how dramatic, we spend all our time fighting a guy, whatever kind of combat it is, swords say, a right-handed people, that during medieval times, if you had a left-handed um, king or a left-handed soldier, you could actually build the port or whatever that staircase is, build it to give the advantage the right, the to the left-handed wow. guy. So that would create, an, and as he spun down, he could have his hand out as he turned down that right. thing. There's so many advantages. It's always been a nature of combat. Imagine that, building an entire rock or a stone staircase to take advantage of the fact that your left hand it's goes down open, there. Right. Shit like that, yeah. it's crazy. Yeah, it, it is crazy. But so now think of this. Uh, Floyd Mayweather, what you look at all the things that he's done brilliant. Among them, in my opinion, is he made, he, he developed his tools when he got so good that he developed his tools into actually being even better at fighting southpaws than orthodox. So that one weapon, you have pull your left hand in, draw back and fire that right hand over there. He exploits the natural tendencies of southpaw. That, that check hook, so you've got a guy who's a mirror image of you and his forward hand is his yep. right and yours is your left. And as you pivot out, you, you hit over top of that shoulder. Mm-hmm. He's actually developed into a specialist at fighting southpaws. His basic best weapons work even better against left handed guys. It's because he found, excuse me, <coughs> he actually found what he's supposed to be doing in life. 
And my personal opinion is that, you know, we all go out trying to explore the things that we're interested in. And eventually, hopefully, if we're lucky, we find s- certain things that we were meant to do in life. Mm-hmm. And, uh, like, for example, we look at a guy like Wayne Gretzky or Sidney Crosby or M- Malkin. We all believe that while they found their path, their path was hockey, they were going to be a success in hockey. What happens if they decided to be race car drivers? Right. Would they find the same amount of success as a race car driver or as an accountant or whatever? Floyd Mayweather clearly was meant to box, considering the fact that he'll go down as one of the top ten uh, best boxers yeah. of all time, one of the top three biggest draws in boxing and financially probably the number one yeah. draw of all time of, of any sport yeah. maybe any type of human who makes money on one night like that this is a separate conversation maybe we'll talk about it more in the next block or maybe we'll just wander wherever yeah. we go like we like to but but one thing that fascinates me floyd mayweather um uh, Lance Armstrong, all these guys, there's a nature that desire to win at all costs seems to negatively affect these guys' lives. And some of them become terrible human beings. Mm-hmm. Like Floyd. Yeah. If you, you know, yeah. read, read the backstory of Floyd Mayweather. And again, we're not here to point the fingers. Yeah. Just go and read yeah. some of the stuff on this yeah. guy. And, yeah, and Lance Armstrong. Sure. And I mean, uh, we could p- pull uh, John Jones. Yeah. You know? yeah, there's many. Like you're looking at people whose single-minded desire for greatness supersedes everything else. Morality, the way they treat other people. And it it's a very strange one. I think we should continue this yeah, conversation yeah. into the next block. I, I, because it is fascinating. I think it is fascinating. And I think that, you know, when you're on a, a pedestal, people are ready to knock yeah. you off. And I think that we should examine, you know, what the motivation of yeah. somebody that wants to get to that mm-hmm. top level. So we'll discuss that. And uh, the Fight Night card coming up with Mark Hunt, Tim Yocic, as well as Frankie Edgar and oh. uh, Uriah Faber. When five rounds today continues. Welcome back to Five Rounds Today. Before the break, we were talking about Floyd Mayweather Jr. Uh, right now, I think the greatest boxer of this generation. Uh, Which kind of almost makes you any generation since the skill and the tools and the sport right. itself is better than it's ever been. Right. The science. Yeah, the science. Uh, but uh, Floyd Mayweather, yes, we admire the fact that he's a great boxer, but a lot of people will look at his past and some of the things that he's done to past wives or girlfriends and family members and that they wouldn't be too pleased with some of the things. But that's sports in general, it seems, especially when we get to the highest level because you have to be so ultra-focused and you have to almost step on heads on on your way or step on toes on your way to the top. You were mentioning Lance Armstrong. And I I was over at Buddy's and we were watching some baseball and and Alex Rodriguez uh, coming up. Now, I I like baseball. I'm not a diehard baseball fan. I think it's a great way to spend a Sunday afternoon just to be able to chill. The game is on. You can drink some beers and do this. But so um, A-Rod comes up and he's just like, oh, this guy's a scumbag. You know, what what a loser. And whatever. I, I look at the fact that we're all individuals. And if I go into Major League Baseball and in the locker room, it's a culture of performance enhancing drugs and that you see that all the guys at the highest level that are achieving success and making millions and millions of dollars, they're all juicers. I think I might go down that path too because of everybody saying the only way that you're going to get big endorsements and that you're going to be able to hit 40 or 50 home runs and a year. everybody that's the top, top guys. Imagine being on the, the lower levels and you know just from being down there, all the guys with big big league jobs are on it. Yeah. Now that's not we don't know that's the case, but a lot. I mean, exactly. you just have to think the nature of striving, single-mindedly trying to be great at something or the best at something. Something we used to all celebrate. The whole we're all oh, look, isn't it great? That guy, look, he's worked so hard. All of that stuff, and it, there is a real, there's a real inspiring nature to that. But I think we also see now a lot more movies and stories and art and stuff being about 
showing the dark side of that. Mm-hmm. You know, I saw Birdman. That's sort mm-hmm. of about fame and the desire to be rich and famous. And and but you, you, Birdman is kind of the opposite in the sense that he wanted to know. I don't know. Spoiler yeah. alert yeah. here. That he had the option of having going down a path for another Birdman yeah. movie, yeah. which would make him millions yeah. of dollars, but. As an artist, he didn't want to have to sell his soul again because it's not what he wanted to do. But the acceptance from the 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 desire desire for for the the acceptance, yeah, yeah. and And that that need to be loved and worshipped—that's a spooky thing. Which is strange because he had his kid there, yeah, and it's you know the person that you know he could get that from was right there, and And he kind of turned his back. Yeah, I I just want to go back to the Alex Rodriguez thing. So we were watching the game, and A Rod comes in. And it's a sea of booze. Everybody seems to hate Alex Rodriguez. Oh, he's a steroid abuser and this and that. He's made money, hasn't delivered. But so he goes up, and it's literally everybody booing at him. And and from what I've seen and what I've read, getting a hit off a major league yeah. pitcher is one of the most difficult things in sports to do. So think about it from Alex yeah. Rodriguez's <laughs> standpoint. You have to get up there, yeah. do one of the most difficult things in yeah. sports, as people are screaming, you're a piece of shit, yeah. boo, and you still yeah. have to perform. To me, yeah. that is mental yeah. strength. Oh, yeah. And same with Floyd Mayweather. Guys at the top of this level are able to push some of that stuff yeah. down and win at all yeah. costs. And if it means taking steroids, yeah. if it means unleashing on somebody, yeah. it doesn't matter they who's in your path. Yeah. I am here to destroy and walk away with the richest. Well, that's the dark side of that level of greatness. It's the dark, dark, evil, gross underbelly of it. And it is, and you can pick any one of these people, oh, blah, 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 Floyd Mayweather. We just, we created these people. Mm -hmm. We created every rock star that is a horrible human being. We've created even every CEO that takes over a company and then fires a thousand people and their families. We've created Lance Armstrong. We've created Floyd Mayweather. We created a world in which People who get rich never feel rich enough. People who get famous never feel p- famous enough. People who are the third best, you know, uh, the guy from Megadeth would read about uh, Metallica oh, no. having Weird. the second biggest record in the world, and he would hear that Metallica yeah. had the first, and he would be angry yeah. and sad. And it's weird. And this weird desire to be great is something, to be a different level of great is something that our society is unquestionably nurtured. A lot of it being through our over-celebration of these people. And I think we're starting to realize that there's a difference. You can marvel at somebody's skills and still be repulsed by them as a human but being. But should should we acknowledge reality? Because I think when you mentioned Lance Armstrong, I think when they drug tested all the people yeah. involved in the, the yeah. Tour de France or whatever it yeah. was where he felt- Drug felt, testing and other evidence. It, it was like yeah. the, the number 25th or 26th guy from the top was the guy that tested clean. So A, are we gonna revere him? Yes. Now, that's the guy we're cheering yeah. for. Meanwhile, his time was so far yeah. off the guy from number one. Is that what we're looking at yeah. right now? Because essentially, this is the guy that did it clean, that worked harder, Mm-hmm. harder than everybody else, but didn't get the results that people were looking for, but these are the real results. Yeah. Well, there's, the weird thing is that we just arbitrarily picked this one thing, this one area of science. Uh, the main reason the Lance Armstrongs of the world take performance enhancing drugs is because they have obsessive compulsive personalities that all they want to do is train more and these drugs let them train more. You, you, I've read that about a number of these guys who failed all these tests and they were like, they were th- the guys who are the obsessive workaholic driven monsters are the ones that benefit the most from steroids and other drugs because it allows them their nature of continuing to Mm. go without uh, fatiguing and tiring they want to go but their bodies won't let them hey wait this science lets me go we don't we don't uh, demonize or outlaw training at elevation, and we don't demonize and outlaw 50 other performance enhancers, but this particular area of science we do. So what's the average, almost sociopathically driven to succeed athlete, uh, businessman, whatever? Competitor. What are they, competitor? What are, what are these people to do? Uh, to, they to look at it and go, well, I can't use this thing that would help me, so I'll do it without, or I can't use this thing that'll help me. Why not? I need to use that uh, thing. Why, yeah, why not? Because you'll fail a drug test. Okay, I'll just pass a drug test. It isn't like this obstacle, this law becomes an obstacle to their morality. This law becomes just another obstacle that in their desire to be the greatest of all time that they have to overcome. Now, is that a personal thing, or is that also inf- uh, outside influences? 
is coming into play because it's like, okay, well, this kid is good, but I know he's not at this level. If he takes this, he'll yeah. be at that yeah. level, and then the riches will be ours. Yeah, yeah. Some of it is driven by specifically that. I think a lot of it is driven by that unquenchable desire to be better and better and bigger and bigger and richer and richer. And I just, I think it's really important. It's a weird thing that we kind of all worship that a little bit. I think it's really important at some point in your life, whatever it is, uh, to recognize that you don't, you should stop striving now. You should find a way to build up a world around where you've achieved that's comfortable and takes care of your family and stuff because the saddest thing in the world is to see somebody, I mean, you know, I'll use, uh, uh, what's his name uh, from, um, uh, Steven Tyler yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, from Aerosmith. People that are much younger than us maybe don't know who Aerosmith is. But what? This, I don't know. You people need yeah. to get a life if you <laughs> don't true. know who Aerosmith is. But Aerosmith and many others like him, and there's millions of young examples. You become amazing. You make some beautiful art. The whole world is good. It's great. And you make great uh, music. You're now 50-something years old. You should go and chill and relax, mm -hmm. make a bit of music for art and have fun. Instead, the guy He's changes his face, now. becomes a, almost He's just a this woman. weird woman. And that, hey, man, if that's if, if, if ch yeah, sure, Bruce, Bruce Jenner, Bruce Jenner. I yeah. mean, that's his right, yeah. you know. But I mean, there's another uh, example of striving. But Bruce Jenner strove to be as masculine as humanly yeah. possible to over overcompensate yeah. for how he felt. So all these strange kinds of the nature of what we've created, especially in North American society. But uh, yeah, Steven Tyler, all of a sudden, he's kind of almost damaging his legacy by being Little Richard, basically, <laughs> yeah. on American Idol or whichever one of those he did, because he just still needs to be on TV. He still needs to be worshipped and followed. And eventually, it's okay to be the 50th best fighter in the world. Right. It's okay to be, you know, our good friend Mauro Ronaldo is, in my opinion, the best he guy the best, in yeah. boxing. Yeah. And uh, he wasn't on that show. And I hope that he, his voice was on an amazing yeah, piece on that yeah, show. I saw that. But I hope he's not troubled by that because Mauro Ronaldo is a mind-blowing uh, boxing announcer, and he doesn't need to fight until he's... Some people need yeah. to come... They need that validation. Uh, we're going to talk about this and a bunch more stuff, so don't go anywhere. More five rounds today when we come back. Welcome back to Five Rounds Today here on FN. John Ramdeen and Robin Black. Uh, we're discussing Mayweather versus Pacquiao. Uh, Mayweather with a unanimous decision victory. We're talking about Lance Armstrong and uh, A-Rod and uh, how athletes and businessmen and CEOs and people in life, they, they're willing to, some people are willing to bend the rules to achieve greatness. They're willing to step on people and they're willing to uh, crush friends and, mm -hmm. and uh, have relationships destroyed for the idea of getting this nut. And, and even if that nut means uh, really nothing to their lifestyle, you know, mm. if you've got $20 million, what's, what's, 10, what's, more million what's dollars? 10, yeah. 10 more million dollars? But there's some people out there, well, I'm willing to destroy a relationship that I've had for 25 yeah. years to get that $10 million. Yeah. What will it mean? It really won't mean anything essentially for my lifestyle because you have a certain lifestyle when you have 20 million bucks. But why is that? Why is that a part of our culture? We see it in sports, and you were talking about it before the break, that people need to be happy with where, where they are, try to stop striving, so to speak. But in, in our world, it's so uncertain the way mm -hmm. things are. You know, you look back when we were kids that the United States was the superpower. This is the place yeah. that you wanted to be. Mm -hmm. Now people are running for the hills. Yeah. Yeah. They want to bail. They, people are willing to, you know what, I'm going to abandon my life where I'm making $100,000 and I'm going to go scoop ice cream in Costa Rica just to be yeah. by the ocean and not have to yeah. deal with the... the the stresses of a first world. Yeah, I think it's all about competition. And uh, I think the capitalist world that we live in 
has become hypercapitalism or supercapitalism or mega capitalism. What we've, what we've learned as a society is go for it, strive for it, do it at all costs, be the best. You know, and that's uh, sports is just an example, but you see it in business and you see it in every walk of life. And I don't think that we uh, kind of understood, it's very different than when we were 10 years old. I don't think we kind of understood the end result of teaching our whole world to be more driven and to be more competitive and to like be ready to slit throats metaphorically or really mm -hmm. in situations to get whatever you want. We used to celebrate that because it is inspiring. It is beautiful to see somebody come from nothing and get something. Mm -hmm. But the, if for one person to be the greatest fighter in the world, that means 500 others that were really, really, really good can't do it, and then 500,000 beneath them can't do it. We all believed we could do whatever we wanted, and that's what our parents told us, and that's what everybody told us. But everybody can't do that if it's all about competition to get there. But we're in a culture now of, of pussies, like, and, and I don't mean to be rude, but it's just like this, I don't know, this Timbits hockey where, where it's all about having yeah. fun. And I agree, yeah. you know, we should, sports are there to have fun, but not everybody gets to win. Yeah. And I think it's sending a wrong message. Yes, but the, the goal should be to go out and, you know, build your kids up. Yeah. But there, there is a point where competition is good. Competition fuels yeah. all of us to get better. And good. losing is good. Understanding yeah. you can't win everything. Yeah. They, uh, I saw The Simpsons uh, the other night, and Abe Simpson and Homer Simpson, it, it was something in there was like, we were the greatest generation, and then we created the worst generation. <laughs> and in a weird kind of way. That's where we're at. Yeah, well, what happened was the idea that everybody gets a trophy. Everybody gets a medal. Everybody wins. Nobody fails. Nobody's held back a grade. We actually taught everybody this bizarre bizarre idea, don't worry, we all got this, when secretly 1% of us are getting that. Mm -hmm. And that happens in sports. The great thing about sports and the great thing about fighting or any other sport is it's a microcosm of the whole world. You can look at it. And John Jones got the nut, the greatest in the world. Mayweather gets the nut, the greatest in the world. These guys' lives are shambles. Mm -hmm. Now, it's easier to have a life. But would it matter if they were the champion of the world? I, I, I personally, I don't think so. I, I think it's irrelevant if Floyd Mayweather had the millions and millions and millions of dollars, or John Jones was the light heavyweight champion. Their lives would be in shambles because of whatever the issues are that they are dealing with. You know, for Floyd Mayweather, it seems to be spousal abuse, yeah. and for John Jones, it Possibly seems to be drug addiction, or choice, other right. bad choices, yes. or whatever it is. So, well, I think, so, like. People who say have a gam, let's say they're addicted to gambling or say they're a drug addict. If their life is going shitty, really bad, the worse it gets, the only way to deal that with that is take more drugs and then ignore it. That would be the short term doing. Mm -hmm. And in doing that, what happens? Your life falls apart more. Oh my God, so I better take more drugs because I feel terrible. I better steal from my mom to get that. And your mm -hmm. life falls apart more. That's how addiction works. Oh my God, I lost everything gambling. Well, if I just round up some money and gamble, one, I'll have the endorphins of gambling, and two, maybe I'll win it back. I think striving to be the best is that. You beat your wife, your life has fallen apart, you've made terrible mistakes, all of these things are happening in your life. That's okay, I'm gonna go to the gym and just train my brains out. That's okay, I'm just gonna stay focused and train my brains out. I think there's an addictive nature, there's an obsessive compulsive nature to Lance Armstrong and Floyd Mayweather and all of these people this desire to give up everything else in your life and have the true, uh, uh, what's the word, selfishness mm. to look at. Nothing else matters except for this goal. But it's also the money, because you know when you've got that much money, if you're Floyd Mayweather and you've got three bucks in the bank and you hit your wife, you know, chances are the cops are coming. Yeah, if right. you're Floyd Mayweather and you've got 200 million bucks yeah. and you hit your wife and yeah. you tell her, I'll give you three and a yeah. half million yeah. bucks. Or seven so, lawyers so, or whatever play, the case, blah, yeah. that might change people's for perspective. Sure, sure. Uh, we're going to talk about this and we promise we're going to talk about Mark Hunt and Stipe Miocic and uh, Frankie Edgar. We like going off on tangents. Uh, I know, we're, and fun. we're probably going to go on more tangents, but uh, hopefully you'll find it interesting. Uh, more when we come back to five rounds today. Fights. That's the phenom. I'll knock him out. You better be ready for me. 
I'm there to fight. And I'm there to win. His elbows are vicious. John Jones, the Port Melbourne. It's going to be a lion facing a lion. I'm going to win the fight. I'm going to push the pace. The plan is to defeat him. Welcome back to Five Rounds today. John Ramdean and Robin Black with you. Uh, before the break, we went off on a tangent. We were talking about uh, competition and how, you know, th we're in a generation where just competing is, is the difference. That everybody gets a trophy, that there are no winners and are no losers, uh, which is horse in my yeah. opinion. Uh, just go to a martial arts gym. There's many facilities I've been to where there's a sign on the wall that says, no whining. If you can't handle mm -hmm. getting hurt, Get the f*** out of yeah. Dodge. Oh, God, yeah. And, uh, you know, the biggest trick of everybody gets a trophy is that secretly you're all sitting there with a trophy, but somebody takes all the riches. Mm -hmm. That happens every single day. It's like, well, life is great. We can have anything. We can all do whatever. But secretly, 1% of people have everything. Mm -hmm. And while we're all kind of convinced that we're all, any, you, hey, man, you could grow up and become the American Idol. Any kid could be in the NFL. You know, yeah, you can't even go to university if you're not rich you know, in yeah. North America where we live. And uh, so it's all kind of a trick to make us all feel like it's all going really well, but realistically, only the ones that are willing to, to do that inhuman level of striving. And I think- It's self-awareness yeah. too. You have to realize, uh, Chase, one of our producers was talking about how uh, he, he believes it was Andre Agassi won a tournament and uh, he got second place and he wasn't satisfied. And you have to be self-aware to say, this is bullshit. This trophy does yeah. not mean yeah, anything. Right. And you have to smash yeah, it in the parking lot, yeah. which apparently he did. And you can see why there's competitors that aren't willing to take second yeah. place. That even if somebody hands them something to say, well, this is the yeah. gold. But that, that greatest generation, like Abe Simpson was saying, we celebrated that and we look back and go, oh, that's what you gotta do. You gotta never accept second place. But then we're also looking at the most sociopathic people being the winners now and how it's sort of not right. working out fair and how your life, people can destroy their own lives in that eternal search for winning. I mean, we mentioned Matt Hume already and we all, it, there's a few people that really impress us with their martial arts view. A martial artist, this is why the difference between a Floyd Mayweather or even a John Jones, that desire that like, in net like unstoppable desire to win is different than a martial arts journey. A martial artist isn't necessarily looking to be the champion. A martial arts uh, is on a journey to become self-aware, to be become a better person, to learn in victory and defeat, in search of answers and truths. Mm -hmm. And I don't think there's a lot of truth in, even Mayweather, we look at it again, marveling at his boxing, the only thing he's better at than that is creating scenarios in which he wins. He right. developed Canelo on the undercards so that he could become a big star, so he could line his pockets yeah, knowing he'd beat this yeah. guy. He, he created a scenario in which the Pacquiao fight wouldn't happen until Pacquiao was, he knew he'd be able to beat Pacquiao. He's laying it all out. It's an art of war strategy. And that's a very sociopathic thing, finding ways to stack the deck when you're already better than everybody. But at the same time, you have to, again, the self-awareness of, okay, I'm in the hurt game. Mm -hmm. I want to make sure that I, he, I'm sure Floyd Mayweather has friends and training partners and family members that are not right because yeah. of the damage of uh, boxing has taken or the toll that boxing has taken on their bodies. So A, let's uh, establish a legacy, check. Yeah. Let's make more money than anybody <laughs> yeah. else in the history of boxing, yeah. check. And let's get out with our brain intact, double yeah. check. Yep. Yeah. And if what we got to do to do it is steal from people and lie to people and hurt people and have a, a harem of 15 women, I, I know a lot of us can imagine yeah. that might not be the worst part, and mistreat your, uh, allegedly mistreat your multiple girlfriends and children and rip people off and create enemies, if that's what it takes, do that. But I guess ultimately we're talking our way around this. There's a beauty in that desire, but there's a dark side that we're seeing more and more of with every great winner. Tiger Woods had a weird sex addiction when he had a beautiful wife at home he was successful i mean you you if you see the truth in a lot of these people it's hard to find a winner without that dark side because somewhere in there it's too hard for people to strive that hard without doing you, know, you want other things in your life you want your family to be good you want to have real friendships 
well, people who are trying to be the greatest in the world can't have. I those just don't things. want the rig the game to be rigged in the sense that you say people striving to get more of a not ten. You know, I just want you know when it's all. I, I've got kids that I want to make sure that they are taken care of. Their their uh, education yeah. is taken care of, and financially they're taken care of. But if the game is rigged, and I plan for okay when I retire to have this, but meanwhile when we get to that yeah. point, you're going to need five times yeah. as much as what you plan for. That kind of changes the game, and you. They have a mentality of, I, I need more. Yeah. I need more to make sure that the next generation is taken care of. Well, I think there's, you know, people that are a little older and, and have a bigger worldview. Because as you age, you have a macro view of the world. Mm -hmm. When you're young, you have a micro yeah, right. view. It's like, what do I do Saturday night? How do I make sure this works? How am I going to get yeah, laid yeah, on, right. you know, whatever. But when you get older, you have a macro view. You start having this interest in the world and history mm -hmm. and where things are going and stuff. And I think people who have that view, whether they are 19 and have it or they're 16, and they have it. I think they look at it and the idea that there is this really unfair nature of what happens when you get this mega capitalist mentality, this mega, we're going to get it, creates a level of uncertainty that causes people to have that mentality. Right. Well, where's the world going? What'll happen if the global yeah. warming if thing change, happens? Uh, things change. Things change. What if, if there's a collapse in the economy? All of these things be, start becoming more uncertain mm -hmm. the more that people have this bizarre level of, of greed. And then the more uncertain they become, people feel this need to have this bizarre level of greed because what if the shit hits the fan? If I have my own army and I have a security mm -hmm. system and I have a house with a wall and I have enough money and food to last forever, whether that's conscious, like we see on TV shows where people yeah. are preppers, yeah. or it's unconscious where they don't know why they need more money, but I just need more money. It's, it's strange. It's a weird conversation that we're having from uh, watching a Mayweather fight. But in my opinion, one of the re beautiful reasons that we watch greatness is to have create com conversations, is to create, be inspired to think of different things. A fight doesn't have to just be how do these guys fight. A fight can really raise some big global existential questions for you. It's or we're crazy. Yeah, no, I agree with you. Uh, and we're going to switch focus. We're going to talk about Mark Hunt and Stipe Miocic because one of the reasons why I think I would, became a fan, obviously I was a martial arts fan, so this automatically would have made sense to me. But another reason why I was so attracted to MMA before it was MMA, it's not, I get to be a part of this thing that nobody was really a part of. Yeah. None of my friends watched No Holds Barred. So I got to see, and you knew the fighters, the, the reason why they were doing this was for the truth of combat. Yeah. There was not millions of dollars. There were, wasn't even thousands of dollars that these guys were doing. I'm sure Joe Dirksen got paid less than $1,000 yeah. for many, of many, his many wins. of his 50 yeah. wins. Matt Hughes is the same thing. I'm sure if you look in history and talk to guys like uh, Evan Tanner, well, not Evan Tanner, yeah. uh, passed, passed away, but guys like that, they were involved in many fights where they walked away with zero dollars. Yeah. But what they were doing was they were helping to build the infrastructure structure of the game of mixed martial arts. And they were looking to figure out if everything they, in search of truth, if you teach me Kung Fu, and I really ha I am somebody who truly is searching for truth. I won't know if that kung fu will work until I try until it against try this it. karate guy. I just won't know. And how serious of a martial artist are you? Are you a martial artist in search of truth to such an extent that you'll put your body on the line to do it? Evan Tanner was. That's yeah. who that That's guy right. was. That's who all these guys were. You're right. That And, I mean, you take a Mark Hunt. When Mark Hunt started in yeah, exactly. uh, kickboxing in particular, Mark Hunt would have had no idea he'd be making hundreds of thousands nope. of dollars this weekend headlining in Australia. Australia, close to his home. He would have traveled wherever he had to travel to to be able to go see if he could beat that guy in a fight. Exactly, and that's what it comes down to, and that's why I love certain athletes in, that are in mar mixed martial arts. That's why I love Robbie Lawler, because when Robbie Lawler was 20 or 21 years old and he was training in, in Iowa at the Militich camp, there is no way he believed that he would be yeah. fighting Matt Brown yeah. on Fox yeah, never. Network. Never. Yeah. When uh, Tim Sylvia punched him in the face full out with a full out right hand, it was because he was trying to figure out how to become a better fighter. It's yeah. true. And, uh, you know, Mark Hunt, we talk about his kickboxing career, but he made his pro MMA debut at Pride FC in June of 2004. And of course, yeah. yes, there was an audience there. There was a Japanese audience, but in North America, it was still yet to have that explosion. Mm -hmm. And that 
to me, I, I think when you think about what the motivation was of, you know, Minotauro and BJ Penn and all these guys, the Frank Shamrocks, the Ken Shamrocks, what, 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 what were they looking for? Were they looking for the truth of combat? Or did they believe that, you know what, I've been in so many fights. When people see fights, they yeah. just come running. Yeah. Eventually, if we keep doing this stuff, people will come running. Maybe in the back of some of their minds. I mean, Lawler told us that he believed it. I don't, you're right, Fox, you know, on Fox. Would they, would they really have thought that? But some of them believe this was going to be a big thing the same way we did when we watched it but uh, you know you look now today there are different kinds of fighters there is the martial artist there's the athlete who runs plays there's the fighter mm -hmm. Matt Brown's a mm -hmm. fighter mm -hmm. you know there's all these yeah. guys back then there was the fighter most of the guys yeah. were yeah. fighters there was the martial artist yeah. there was the guy who's searching for personal tests mm -hmm. you know I don't know you know those guys don't get as far now because you find those personal tests on the grassroots level yeah. you, and you know guys who are willing to to be tested mm -hmm. don't win all the time they kind of some of them don't end up at the top but I think there were more of those guys Evan Tanner really wanted to see what he was made of yeah. you know um, Matt Hume who we mentioned was a martial artist uh, um, Mark Hunt was a fighter there was particular types and then other guys just they didn't have nothing going for them and seemed to be good at that and they got out of jail or they lost yeah. their job as a bouncer and what the hell you know it was a different time for sure uh, when we come back to five rounds today we're going to discuss this main event between Mark Hunt and Stipe Miocic which coincidentally you can catch live on FN if you don't have it try to find a way to get it it is the best channel on TV Hello, I'm John Pollock here to remind you to catch Fight News Now, the MMA edition, every Wednesday night here on Fight Network. You will hear from the biggest names making news in mixed martial arts, plus John Rambin and Robin Black provide commentary and deep analysis on three rounds, and we'll also bring you the latest in fight culture on the ship. All that plus the weekly viral video. That's Fight News Now, every Wednesday night here on Fight Network. Welcome back to Five Rounds today. We we're discussing a whole bunch of stuff on the show today, uh, just about the mentality of sports and what drives competitors and, uh, you know, eating the, the rich eating the little guy and people willing to abandon their, their morals to achieve success at the highest level in sports. Uh, coming up Saturday, live on FN, Mark Hunt, Stipe Miocic, Mark Hunt. Did achieve success at the highest mm -hmm. level in the world of kickboxing. Stipe Miocic, kind of the new age of heavyweight, athletic wrestle boxer. But uh, when we were in, in Laval, Quebec recently, we were talking to one of the guys from TriStar, and he says, you know, you can prepare technically for anything. You can go and work with the, the, the best guys to refine your Muay Thai and your boxing, and, and I'm paraphrasing, and your jiu-jitsu skills. But at the end of the day, it's a fight. Yeah. And there's certain elements of a fight that you just can't describe that chaos. And even though Stipe Miocic might have the better wrestling pedigree and he might have the better technical mixed martial arts boxing and a more athletic uh, background and a, uh, f a better physique, yeah. that's irrelevant because Mark Hunt knows how to fight. And now he seems to be really firing on all cylinders when it comes to his full mixed martial arts game. I think your top guys at 45, 55, and 70, and, and even smaller, who are technically brilliant, the top 20 of them in the world, we're at a point where they're kind of starting to really look the same. Yeah. The little subtleties yeah. and things guys do better, better and different, but they all know the same stuff. And uh, at heavyweight, because they move differently, you still have these real clashes of styles. Right. You know, guys develop different. You can't really, you know, you can t take um, uh, Demetrius Johnson and teach him every single thing in the world and teach him the flow and the instinct and the ability to shift gears and to paint a picture of carnage to your face. And you can't really teach these giant bodies that as much. So you get, Guys like Hunt. Why? So I'm sorry to interrupt. Fatigue and all of that. Physicality. Like, you know, you don't see any 250 pound gymnasts, like but, in the Olympics. But then uh, there's all there's always seems to be an exception. You look at a guy like Sean Jordan, for yeah. example. Well, this guy does yeah. backflips. Yeah. Uh, Travis and, Brown seems yeah. to be able to move fast. Will we see a time where the heavyweights. Yeah. 
maybe not are as mobile and as athletic as the flyweights, but will we see a closer matching? I, I think so. I think if we brought a football guy in here who did what we do in football for 20 years, he would be able to tell you just how different these massive football players are in their agility and speed and zero to 60 acceleration and able to execute all these things. And if you could see it in those athletes, you definitely would see it in these athletes. It's a younger sport, and it's even the the teaching and the learning is younger. But uh, I like this one because they they are very different. Hunt. Uh, wins things and wins battles with giant broad strokes. The right stepping of the, of his feet means that whatever little things you're doing, he's not in front of you, so you can't do them. Right. So he uses big giant strokes to like make you. You're trying to do subtleties. Miosic is trying to play on the inside, do all these smart subtle things, use feints and little things to to throw off Hunt and Hunt use giant things to make them irrelevant. So that's neat to me. But uh, you mentioned uh, the, how uh, guys able to execute and it's a fight no matter what. Uh, the, the biggest misunderstanding I think that we all have is how bizarrely incredible it is that in the turmoil and the trauma and the head trauma and the heart to breathe <laughs> and your nose full of blood and all those things, it is that any of these guys can execute any of these things. Because you go train for five years in the gym, you will see this with brand new guys. And I'm sure you take a guy like um, that pro wrestler, uh, CM, CM Punk. Punk. Duke is such a brilliant coach that he'll create scenarios in which he gets to experience almost fights. But you take a guy like that, you teach him for a few years, you put him in there. The first thing, win or lose, he's going to tell you after is, I can't believe how hard it was to do everything I could do <laughs> exactly. in the gym. Robbie Lawler yeah. told yeah. us that. Yeah. He said, you That's know, right. You know, so if the welterweight champion says, oh, there's just some times that you just can't do the things that you've spent years honing yeah. in the gym in a fight. Yeah, and you do them every single day in the gym, smooth and technical, and now you just can't do them. And that is true of every guy. And the, the reason the best are the best is because they can, they can perform. Some guys perform arguably better in a fight than they do in the gym. And that level of brain, of the, the your use of your gray matter and ability to be able to perform like that, that's so in, so bizarrely rare that I wish that we kind of all saw that because we have these weird expectations of what these guys should be able to do. Uh, when we come back, we're going to wrap things up. We're going to continue to talk about this card that goes down in Australia. Mark Hunt, Stipe Miocic, when five rounds today continue. Next Friday, anything is possible when Impact Wrestling goes live. Expect the unexpected as Gail Kim and Awesome Kong join forces for the first time ever to take on the Dollhouse at a knockout tag team showdown. Plus, make your vote count as Ethan Carter III faces Mr. Anderson in a battle where the Impact Wrestling fans decide the match stipulation. All this and more on a night where anything can happen. Welcome back to Five Rounds Today. A uh, bunch of stuff. We're going to talk about Mark Hunt and Stipe Miocic uh, when we wrap things here. But uh, we're going to talk about some of the cool stuff going on on FN. You got a chance to hang out with uh, Rory McDonald, Chuck Liddell, and Forrest Griffin, two uh, former champions and a man that will probably be a future champion. Yeah, it was super cool. And we went and I had them compete to see who could make the best poutine in Montreal when we were there. Awesome. So people see that on YouTube, but you also see it on our preview shows. You know, the best work we're doing in this place or among it is our Saturday preview shows an hour before the main card. So definitely watch. I also got a black eye that I built of Hunt versus Miocic as a monster B movie. So, and I think we'll have that on YouTube too. Uh, the preview show and then uh, coming up at 11 p.m. If you're a subscriber of FN in Canada, you'll get the uh, the UFC main event, Mark Hunt, cool. Stipe Miocic. Uh, I want to talk about a couple, because for years we heard, you know, Australia is just so yeah. far behind when it comes to mixed martial arts. But uh, there's a couple of uh, shining lights yeah. or bright bright stars. I think that two guys, Robert Whitaker is going to be taking on Brad Tavares, and that's a tough, yeah. tough fight. 
for the 24-year-old Robert Whitaker. And then the undefeated 20-year-old Jake Matthews taking on the undefeated James Vick. Jake, Jake Matthews, I think, is definitely one that people should look at. Both for. of these yeah. two guys are very good. And all it takes is one, two, then three, then five from a country. And then the skills and the techniques and the coaching and the coaches, all trickles yeah. down. Uh, Whitaker, I mean, they, they've given both these guys yeah. really serious fights. I don't want to say that in Brazil sometimes you get a little easier. <laughs> sometimes. Ones, but sometimes they do. Sometimes I don't know whether do. that's matchmaking or how hard it is. Yeah. You need young, hungry guys willing to go to Brazil maybe because it's a tough yeah, place to right. fight and it's expensive and stuff. But, man, they gave these uh, Australians some uh, legit competition. How cool is it, though, a main card here? Yeah, very cool. Yeah. Uh, also, if you've uh, followed, if you've watched Fight Network for any length of time, we used to air TKO. You would have seen Hatsu Hiyoki mm -hmm. on those cards as well as, I think, Sengoku. Yeah. Uh, Hatsu Hiyoki in action against Daniel Hooker, uh, Anthony Parash, Sean O'Connell, Smiling Sam Alvey, and then, of course, our main event, Stipe Miocic, uh, Mark Hunt. You're going with Miocic? Yeah, it's a tough one. I've had a hard time actually picking. I never realized how good Miocic was until I started breaking him down three or four or five of his last fights. He really is incredibly talented. But it, you're crazy to call, to uh, count out Mark Hunt, not only because of the power, which I think is the mm -hmm. the big thing people think of, but his footwork and his positioning. He can make guys look re really, really bad. But Miocic has looked – he's he's a lot better even than I thought. And I think that's the guy. That's my pick, Stipe Miocic, uh, kind of cruising under the radar. That's it for us. Uh, we want to thank you guys for tuning in. Got to thank our producer, Chase Kaiser. He is Robin Black. I'm John Ramdean. Tune in next week for Five Rounds Today. <laughs>